Welcome everyone to the Pinterest Labs uh, Distinguished uh, Speaker Series. Um, my name is uh, Jure Leskovec and I'm a Chief Scientist at Pinterest. And um, we are organizing uh, these types of talks uh, once a month where we bring uh, together the community from industry as well as uh, from academia uh, to share uh, latest uh, research trends, uh, la latest uh, exciting developments across uh, many exciting uh, areas of uh, computer science, uh, mostly around artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, as well as uh, large-scale data processing systems um, and uh, societal issues like uh, fairness, accountability, uh, and bias in uh, AI systems. Um, the way we organize these talks is that uh, we have a speaker join us for an, uh, for an hour, um, and then uh, the, the, the logistics for the talk are is that the talk lasts for about 45-50 minutes. Uh, if you have a question, please uh, use the Q&A feature uh, of Zoom. You can type in the question there. And uh, at the, uh, when the talk finishes, I'm going to moderate the Q&A session by reading those questions and uh, the speaker is going to uh, answer them. Um, so to introduce the speaker, uh, today I'm uh, super excited uh, to be able to uh, introduce uh, Ras Salakudino, who's a UPMC professor of computer science at the machine learning department at uh, Carnegie Mellon University in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, Ras received his PhD in computer science from University of Toronto. And after a postdoc at MIT, he joined uh, the University of Toronto and then later moved to uh, Carlingi Mellon. Uh, his primary research interests uh, lie in deep learning, machine learning, and large scale optimization. And, and Russ is really one of those people who, was, who is at the forefront of the deep learning revolution, who pioneered some of the earliest models that really showed how deep neural networks can give us the edge and how they can achieve a state-of-the-art performance uh, across uh, many different tasks. Uh, Russ is also very active in the machine learning community. He was a program co-chair of ICML, International Machine Learning Conference, and also serves on um, senior program committees of top machine learning conferences like NeurIPS uh, and ICML. Uh, he's also uh, a recipient of uh, many awards like the Alfred P. Sloan Fellowship, Microsoft Research Faculty Fellow, uh, Canada Research Chair in Statistical Machine Learning, um, as well as recipient of Early Researcher Awards, Google Faculty Award, and NVIDIA's Pioneer of uh, AI Award. Um, so with this, I'm uh, really excited to uh, introduce uh, Russ. Um, and uh, today he's going to talk to, talk to us about differentiable reasoning uh, from semantic to visual navigation. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Raz, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Yuri, uh, for the introduction. Let me uh, share my screen um, uh, one second and we'll kick it off. So um, thank you very much for, for the introduction and for the invitation. So I thought that today I would talk about some of the research that we've been doing at, at CMU and sort of give you a, a larger highlight of, um, of the research agenda. So we've seen uh, an impact of deep learning in, in multiple areas. You know, if you look at speech recognition, vision, recommendation systems, in, in spaces like language understanding, and, and also if, even if you look at drug discovery and medical image analysis. So one of the things is, you know, we can ask, what is it that we wanna do? Well, ultimately, many of us in the machine learning and AI communities are trying to build AI, uh, which is to develop computer algorithms that can see and recognize objects around us, that can understand us, uh, that can reason and understand natural language that can move around autonomously, explore, plan, and display human-like intelligence. So these are sort of high-level goals. Um, now, when I think about some of the research challenges that we face today, there's a number of them. Um, and I'll talk about some of them in this, in this talk. Um, I think that one of the uh, biggest challenges is, is natural uh, language understanding and reasoning. How do we build systems that can understand human language and actually do some form of reasoning? Um, there is also a lot of work happening in the space of uh, what's called embodied AI, 
um, in the space of uh, reinforcement learning and control. And we'll talk about uh, uh, some of that in this talk as well. Um, another area of research uh, which is uh, very important is how do we incorporate structured prior knowledge, domain knowledge into these uh, deep learning systems. And also looking at the space of multimodal learning, self-supervised learning, semi-supervised learning. These are all areas that sort of, you know, gaining a lot of momentum in, uh, uh, in, in sort of in, in our community and, and in, in today's uh, research. So let me jump into the first part and I'll spend a little bit of time looking at some of, um, some of the challenges in, in language understanding. And a lot of this kind of slides and the work was done by Bowen um, Dingra, who's uh, my former student, who's, uh, who's gonna be joining Duke uh, as a faculty. So when we think about deep learning models, we typically think about inputs going through the neural networks, um, deep neural network, and then going into the output. So for example, you know, you've probably seen examples where I show you this image, where I give you some image and I want my model to output whether this is a cat or not. Or if I give an input in English, I want my output to be translation into a different language. Uh, there is a whole area of research of neural machine translation systems that, that have been very successful. Uh, but let's say I give you an example, you know, which coronaviruses are known to infect people. How do you answer that question? Um, well, so this is where some form of domain knowledge or some form of a prior knowledge would come in, right? Either in the forms of unstructured data, such as Wikipedia articles or articles, or maybe in the form of knowledge graphs, um, perhaps some other form. So the question is, how can we incorporate that structure? So, you know, some of the challenges when we face when, you know, uh, uh, dealing with these, uh, with these complex questions is that the data can be heterogeneous, right? It can come across different, multiple different sources. We have to do some form of reasoning. So that basically means that we have to pile, we have to get information from different sources of data and, you know, get the information and sort of accumulate it in, 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 uh, in, in an appropriate way. Um, and also, ultimately, we want to be able to build systems that work under what's called weak supervision. So if I give you, for example, an example like this, which coronaviruses are known to infect people, maybe a human would label that, you know, SARS or COVID-19 are known to infect people, but uh, not necessarily, you know, give you precisely the, the line in Wikipedia article that, you know, provides you with the right answer or give you the precise location in your knowledge base uh, that gives you the precise answer, right? So these are known as, as weak supervision. So um, let me kind of, you know, focus first on one particular problem, uh, which is open domain question answering systems. So uh, where we're trying to find answers to factual questions when we pose in natural language. So for example, if I ask the question, who voiced Megan and Family Guy, you know, I have the answers. Um, now, when we think about knowledge bases, this has sort of uh, uh, been around for quite some time. We can think about knowledge bases as finding some important concepts. Let's say we look at the Wikipedia articles and we find some concepts. Uh, we can also find relations or facts about these concepts or what uh, are these called entities. So for example, when we're building a knowledge graph, we can say, well, diabetes is an instance of a disease or a specific drug, Voglebos, is being treated by uh, is being is, is, is treated by, uh, sorry, diabetes is treated by Voglebos, uh, right? So we can construct these knowledge bases. And in fact, a lot of uh, systems, sort of QA systems today, if you look at um, Google, Siri, Alexa, a lot of these systems, what they're effectively doing is they're building these large scale knowledge bases. And obviously building these knowledge bases is expensive. You have to do it by hand and you have army of labelers who kind of, you know, uh, construct these uh, these uh, these knowledge bases. Um, now, can we go beyond that? Um, you know, one answer, uh, uh, one question you could ask is that if I ask you the question, maybe what you could do is you could say, well, can I take the information from, let's say, Wikipedia articles as well as the information from my knowledge base, fuse that information together, perhaps go through some form of a graph comprehension algorithm. Um, that, that walks through the knowledge base. At the same time, it also gets information from unstructured data like Wikipedia articles, for example, to give me the answer. And these kind of like systems have advantages because sometimes knowledge bases can be incomplete. So if they're incomplete, you can only get the data or you can get the answer from unstructured text. Um, 
And so, you know, ultimately we want to be able to fuse uh, the information together. So one thing that you can think about what, we, what we've been doing in this is uh, 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 trying to build knowledge graphs that are augmented with textual information. So here's an example where we might have some knowledge graph, right? The entities, how they relate, what the relationship between entities are, uh, like where they, you know, who was voiced by whom or who was the character uh, where. And then we can also have access, let's say we also have access to sentences and sentence kind of describing what's, what's going on with the characters. So here we can build a system that basically propagates information from these sentences into the knowledge graph so that ultimately we can perhaps construct even better knowledge graph or refine our knowledge graph. At the same time, we can also get information from the knowledge graph and propagate it into the representation learning of, of, of these sentences. So one example could be that, you know, if you're using transformers to get the representation of your sentences, you can enhance the representation that you're getting from a transformer with the representation that you're getting from your knowledge graph. Um, and so, you know, as example, if you ask who voiced the dog in the family guy, then we can perhaps kind of have the system where we have a family guy, which is the entity that goes through the sentence that links family guy to a, you know, to, to a dog named Brian, and then we get uh, the rest of the information in, 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 uh, in the knowledge base. So you can think of propagation through the knowledge graph is kind of happening in this joint space, space of entities and the space of, uh, in this case, sentences, right? In the space of text. And we get the answer. So ultimately, you know, given the question, we get some representation of the question, which typically could be used, uh, could be uh, the representations coming out, out of the recurrent neural network or a transformer network. Um, and then uh, we get the representation also that's coming, the joint representation coming from the knowledge graph and the sentence representation through the graph neural network. And these representations get pulled together to sort of, you know, provide the, uh, provide the answer. And so here's the updates that we have through the knowledge, uh, through the graph neural network. And again, you can think of it as sort of, you, you get this representation of the text mentions, where certain mentions, uh, uh, where certain uh, uh, words are mentioned combining it with the, uh, uh, with the representations coming from the knowledge graph. One thing that I just wanted to mention, uh, perhaps this is the mathiest part of the talk, is to sort of, uh, I wanna highlight this idea um, of, of um, graph neural networks that have been gaining a lot of momentum in, momentum in recent years. Um, so here, given a graph with vertex and edges and some natural language question Q, we wanna be able to learn a function such that the output of this function is one, if and only if the particular node in your knowledge graph is the answer to the question, uh, right? And so we, we get the, uh, we model it using the softmax uh, distribution, which is essentially basically looks at the compatibility between the representation we get from the question and the representation that we get from our, uh, from our nodes in the knowledge graph. Um, and so here HQ again is the representation that's coming off from LSTM network and HV is the representations coming from the graph convolutional neural network. And just to kind of point out what the graph convolutional neural network is doing, it's, it's essentially, you know, uh, same principle as what uh, deep neural networks are doing or recurrent neural networks are doing. Essentially, you're basically saying, well, if to get the information from this node, I'm just looking at the information of all the neighboring nodes Right, so that's looking at all the neighboring nodes. You collect the information, you pass it through nonlinearity, and that net output goes into uh, 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 another node. So essentially, you know, graph neural networks are just basically the same, have the same principle as recurrent neural networks, except for the structure is defined by the graph, right? Um, as opposed to kind of like as a time series that we have in recurrent neural network. We can also handle relations, which is very important because uh, our knowledge graph will have multiple relations. And essentially what ends up happening here is we have parameters associated with different relations. Uh, and ultimately, you know, we can kind of, again, as I mentioned before, we can have this propagation where if we're trying to update the representation that's coming out of LSTM, what we can do is we can get the representation of LSTM and augment it with representation that's coming from the knowledge graph. So this is just concatenation operation. And if we're trying to improve the representation now knowledge graph, then what we can do is we can basically take the representation coming out of the language or of the sentence from the current neural network and pass that information to update the node in our knowledge graph. 
uh, right? So essentially you can, at the high level, you can think of it as unstructured text enhancing representation of a knowledge graph. And at the same time, the representation that we get from the knowledge graph can enhance the representations that we're getting from unstructured text, uh, text uh, such as what we're getting from transformers or from recurrent neural networks. And typically, you know, these models, they do work quite well. Um, in many cases, you know, if we look at the knowledge graph and we say, well, our knowledge graph is only 50% complete. So we take and randomly remove 50% of the nodes in the knowledge graph, then, you know, representations that we're getting from the text uh, can, you know, substantially improve um, overall performance. Um, so again, text information is also useful for handling kind of unseen um, entities that you don't really have in your knowledge graph. Okay, now one other thing that I wanted to highlight is, is there's, uh, there's these ideas of what's called multi-hop questions. Um, so the idea here is again, maybe we can have a question, we can get some representation, we can link this representation through the knowledge graph and you know, provide the answer. But let me show you an example where things get a little bit more interesting. So suppose I give you the following question. Suppose I ask you, uh, where is the company which manufactured Voglebo's headquarters? So you have to think about this particular question. You have to say, well, which company manufactures this specific drug? And given the answer to this question, you have to ask the question, well, where is X headquartered, uh, right? And so maybe by looking at the text information, textual corpus, you can say, you can find the answer to the first question. You can say, well, this particular drug is a product of Takeda Pharmaceutical Company, uh, Japan's largest pharmaceutical company. And then, you know, once you know the answer to the first question, you can say, you can try to find the answer to the second one, where you can say, you can find that Takeda Pharmaceutical Company is headquartered in, uh, in uh, Chuko, Osaka, right? So the answer is Osaka. Um, now, what's interesting about these class of questions is that the internal representations here are unknown, um, right? So generally, nobody's going to give you uh, for this specific question, decomposition of the question into two questions and provide you the answers to both questions. So you need to figure out, you know, uh, uh, you need to figure out the answer to the first question before you can even figure out how to answer the second question. And so a lot of systems today, you know, if you're using, you know, Siri or Google, many times these complex questions are actually much harder to answer. Um, and so we need to kind of build in perhaps some form of a prior knowledge to be able to answer those questions. Um, and uh, uh, of course, I mean, generally speaking, it's 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 um, uh, it's an you know up to now. Well, it's it's an unsolved problem, uh, right? What's interesting is that for humans, it's actually quite easy to solve these kind of multi-hop questions because humans are very good at decomposing questions into sub-questions. And you can find information about sub-questions and pull information together to provide, uh, to provide the answer. So you can argue that this is, represents you know, a very basic form of reasoning uh, you have to do in order to answer those, uh, those questions. So when we think about you know, how can we do this? Well, can we do it in an end-to-end -end fashion? Can we build systems that we can train in the end-to-end -end fashion as opposed to like decomposing into multiple, uh, multiple pieces? Can we make it uh, can we make it efficient uh, so that we can answer questions, you know, fairly quickly? And can we build a model that's uh, compositional? So if we're answering two hop questions, maybe we can answer three hop questions and so forth. So this is the system that we've built. Uh, let me show you an example. So let's say I ask you the question, which company founded by Steve Jobs was based in Redwood City? And this is the system that's running on a single desktop. Um, this is system running in real time. And just to show you that uh, here we're analyzing about 5 million Wikipedia articles. And in a fraction of a second, I think we can handle about five or six questions on a single desktop using a single GPU. Uh, we can handle about, about you know, five or six questions, uh, these multi-hop questions by analyzing 5 million Wikipedia articles. So just to show you an example of what the answer, the answer is next. And what the system is finding, the system is finding is that Jobs was the chairman and CEO of Apple, and he was also CEO of Next. And then the second passage that the model finds is that the Next is the company, blah, 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 that was based in Redwood City, right? So the answer to the question would be Next. And these are also top sort of uh, paragraphs that's being retrieved. And what's highlighted in, uh, in yellow is a specific sentence that has the highest probability 
um, um, to answer kind of the top right sentence to answer, to answer the question. So let me show you how we do this, uh, how we built the system. One of the key ideas here is to inject a little bit of prior knowledge into what's called uh, relational following. Uh, and this is what we call differentiable reasoning. Uh, so the idea here is that uh, given a set of entities, let's say a set of nouns, so in this case, you know, this could be, uh, 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 Voglebos could be uh, uh, an entity. Given a set of entities, you follow relation R and, you know, you get to, you, you arrive to another set of entities Y. And then again, you follow another relation R2 to get to the next set of uh, entities, right? So for example, here, X would be Voglebos, which is a specific type of a drug. R1, the first relation would be the manufacturer so you can kind of like X, you, you have to follow the relation R given X, you follow who manufactures the specific drug, given the set of answers, you say, what's the headquarter location, right? So the intuition here is that given this question, ideally we would want to parse it into, you know, X, what's the first relation, what's the second relation, right? And then we can build the system that follow these relations to be able to answer, uh, the, answer the question. So how exactly are we doing this? So just to tell you what the text corpus we're working with, um, the text corpus we're working with is uh, we have sentences, which we call mentions. So we handling, or uh, I think in our case, uh, we handling about 500,000 sentences. Uh, I think we went up to, um, I think we went up to a billion sentences. So think of basically every single sentence in Wikipedia that basically becomes our mention. And then we're also working with about 500,000 entities. You can think of them as nouns or names of places. Um, these become entities. So again, we have about 500,000 mentions, sentences, and we have about 500,000 entities, uh, right? And then uh, uh, the links here are basically represented, you know, this particular entity family guy is mentioned in this sentence. And this particular entity is mentioned in this sentence and this sentence, right? Uh, so you can think about, you know, 500,000 by 500,000, like bipart type of a graph, uh, which entities are mentioned in what mentions and, and, and such. So now how do we solve the problem? Well, let's say we have X, our noun or our uh, 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 entity, and we have a relation, it's a dog in a show. Uh, we do operation in three steps. We first expand X to co-occurring mentions. So we're basically finding all the sentences that have a mention, right? So these are all the sentences that include family guy. Let's say these are gonna be on the order of you know, 10,000, 20,000. Then we're gonna filter those mentions based on the relation. So what we're gonna do, and this is where learning happens. Uh, the learning basically says, well, this mention and this mention doesn't really follow the relation dog in the show, but this mention does. Right? So there's a filtering step that basically says which sentences are important, which sentences are not important. Um, and the third step is basically combining scores of the same entity, right? So it's kind of like aggregation step. Um, and what the key idea here is actually in hindsight, it's actually pretty trivial. We can do this efficiently with just the dot products, with inner dot products, uh, right? And so the scores that we're getting is the mention context, the sentence itself, and the relation. How compatible a particular sentence with a specific relation that we're trying to model, right? Um, so let me show you uh, very briefly what these three steps are. So the first step is the following. We're gonna expand X to co-occurring mentions. So let's say we have a long vector, one of K encoding, which basically says this element is one if I is the mention, otherwise it's zero. So we'll look at family guy, for example. Then we have a pre-computed sparse matrix, which is of size, you know, a billion by billion, uh, right? Which basically says family guys mentioned in this sentence, it's mentioned in this sentence, it's mentioned in this sentence, uh, right? And uh, by just doing the dot product between, um, uh, between this, we basically, uh, uh, you know, rotating or moving V into the um, mention space. So this just basically picks up which sentences uh, this mention occurs, right? So this is just pre-computed, this is offline, and you know, it's fairly efficient to do sparse matrix multiplication. It's just a lookup table, you know, that's all. Uh, then once we have the relation, how do we filter the mentions? Well, given the relation, 
we get the representation of this relation using transformer architectures, right? We also get the representation of the sentence and, and we get uh, um, through the transformer network. And uh, we can basically compute the score, right? So we can compute the score between the relation and the representation that we're getting from our sentence. Right, and these are pre-trained using large-scale language models. So you can, you know, I think our experiments were done on BERT-like uh, 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 network, transformer network. Okay, so what is it that we exactly do? Well, one thing we do is we build a large offline index. So basically, what we do is we take every single sentence and we embed it into um, three hundred dimensional space. So every single sentence in all of Wikipedia now gets represented as this large scale dense index, right? So think of it as an embedding of sentence and the context around each sentence into 300 dimensional space, right? And then what we do is we basically look for the top K nearest neighbors. Now, and once we find, uh, you know, the top K nearest neighbors, we just do the dot product. Now there's some um, um, details of exactly how we, do that and how we actually learn. So what we actually do is we fine tune this index that we get from the transformer architecture. And we also fine tune this representation that we're getting off of, of the relations, uh, right? So there's a learning basically happens. We want the correct answer to be in the top K and we want kind of like incorrect answers to kind of push down. So there's a learning um, um, uh, architecture which is just a margin based loss which essentially tries to push the correct answer to be in the top K because we want to be able to be, actually we want it to be the top one, okay? But the important piece here is that this is pre-computed so we can you know, afford working with large scale data. We, we never touch these sentences, uh, right? Everything is computed and in, 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 in stored in an offline index. Uh, and once we get this filtering, uh, then we can basically, you know, uh, uh, look at the mentions that satisfy this relation. So we're basically filtering out all the stuff that uh, doesn't relate to the relation that we're trying to extract. And then the last step is basically combining the scores, which is essentially, you know, converting it back into the entity space. So you can think of this B matrix as the inverse of the A matrix, actually it's a transpose of the A matrix, um, right? And that basically gives us uh, which, uh, which entity survives and we pick the one with the highest score. Um, right, so it's just a simple aggregation stage. And so what we end up having with, uh, we basically, again, we have this expansion, we have filtering stage, and we have a combination stage. What's interesting about this architecture is that it's efficient. It's a polylog in the number of mentions. So we can handle, uh, you know, we can handle uh, billions of mentions. We can basically handle every single sentence in the Wikipedia article. Um, it's close to the composition, which basically means that, you know, we can extract relation R, which gives us a set of entities. Again, we can operate the follow, you know, second relation. That's exactly what we do. Once we have this particular operation, this gives us a set of entities. We just, you know, stick another um, uh, follow relation and we get uh, a, a two hop uh, representation, right? And it's also differentiable because we can actually take the gradients and propagate these gradients and update parameters of this filtering stage. Uh, so which is, you know, which is very nice. So, and that's how uh, the training is actually uh, happening. And so what we end up having is we have the stage where we do soft entity linking, which is essentially tries to figure out what mentions we should be looking at. Uh, the R1, the first uh, uh, relation, we use the transformer to extract R1. So it's not perfect but that's effectively what we do. And uh, the second relation, again, we use the transformers to extract the second relation. Uh, perhaps there are better ways of figuring out what X, R, Y, and R2 are, are. And so, you know, uh, if there are better ways of doing it, I think that can improve the system by a lot. Right now, we just kind of, you know, uh, uh, using the transformer architectures to extract those ones. One thing I also want to point out is that there is, you know, there's a little bit of domain knowledge that comes in here, right? Because we know what the structure of the questions are, you know, X follow relation R1, follow relation R2. We effectively design our architectures to, you know, be that way, uh, right? We, we, we basically specifically, uh, uh, instead of just putting the entire question in the transformer architecture and just providing the answer, here we're actually combining them in a very specific way, right? 
Uh, and that, again, can be done in the end-to-end, -end, and this is how we're training these systems in an end-to-end -end fashion. One thing I want to uh, point out is that in terms of um, the results, you can sort of see that the two hop and three hop questions, you know, we can improve over graph neural networks. And I think this gap is quite substantial. And of course, you know, just uh, doing one step retrieval, which basically means we don't even respect the multi hop uh, representation, you know, you're not, you're not doing quite well. So you have to do multiple step retrieval to be able to answer those questions. Uh, but the other thing is that I want to emphasize is the speed. Because we're constructing these offline indices, um, we can actually operate quite quickly and be able to answer questions quite quickly, right? So in terms of, again, we can handle, I, think, I guess in this case, we can handle like, you know, 13 questions in a second or 20 questions in a second. Uh, so it's, you know, fairly fast. Uh, here's another example I want to show you uh, very quickly. Now, if I ask you the question, which is the shape of the viruses, the family of viruses containing coronavirus, um, then again, you're looking at 5 million Wikipedia articles and you're basically finding that coronaviruses belong to a specific family um, called coronavirus, uh, coronavirus, I guess coronavirus die. And then, you know, this specific uh, family, you know, is known to be spherical. Right, and so the answer is spherical. So again, you, you kind of like aggregating information across multiple retrieved uh, steps to, to, provide, uh, to provide the answer. And ultimately, you know, I sort of um, put the slide here, which represents, you know, one of the big challenges is how do we represent the knowledge? You know, when we talk about multi hop reasoning, we sort of bake in this polar relation, right? But it only works for specific type of questions. You know, if the question has, you know, intersection part to it, it's very hard to kind of, you know, uh, uh, do that. Uh, so that's one kind of uh, open, open question. And also, if we think about human knowledge, human knowledge is abstract, it's little high level concepts. You know, if, if you look at this image, it's an image of a dog, we know dogs have four legs, uh, right? Uh, and existing systems today, you know, convolutional neural networks, if I take this dog and I have six legs instead of four legs, uh, the convolutional neural network is going to say, yeah, it's a dog because it has all the patterns of the dog. It has all the other features of the dog. So it must be a dog, uh, right? So how can we, you know, integrate this knowledge and how do we do it efficiently, you know, remains uh, an open question. Okay, let me now kind of like switch gears just a little bit and talk about um, uh, embodied AI systems and, and deep reinforcement learning. And I'm also going to show you how can we connect it to the language understanding piece, okay? So let's, let, let, let's look at the embodied AI problem. So when we think about building um, in the context of reinforcement learning, we typically think about building or learning behaviors, right? You kind of like mapping a sequence of observations that you see to a sequence of actions and you want to achieve a particular goal. So if we think about physical intelligence, let's say you have an agent, the agent observed the environment, the agent takes an action. And so the agents need to move around the world physically you know, uh, whatever action you take will impact your future observations, right? So if I turn left, I'm going to see one image. If I turn right, I'm going to see a different image. So it requires some notion of spatial and, and semantic understanding of, of the environment, right? So we're going to look at one specific task, and this is the task of navigation. Let's say I, you know, have my agent and I tell my agent, go to this specific location. If the agent gets to that location, you get the reward. If the agent doesn't, you get, you know, negative reward. And so when we think about deep reinforcement learning, typically we think about the system where you give in the input, you pass it through some deep neural network, and this deep neural network outputs actions, you know, turn left, turn right. And then sometimes you get rewards. And if you get the positive reward, well, that was a good action to take. And you train your system to say, you know, take actions that lead to rewards and don't take actions that lead to negative rewards. Essentially, you can think, and that's essentially the essence of end-to-end -end deep reinforcement learning systems. A lot of deep RL systems are essentially operating in that, in that space and exactly what learning algorithm you use to update model parameters and so forth uh, is, what, uh, is where the research is. Um, now, so let's say you're trying to navigate, but let's say you're trying to navigate to a particular goal. Let's say I give you an image goal, I show you an image of a TV and I tell you, find me this TV. Or, or maybe I give you the language instruction. Uh, you know, go, go find me the, 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 the blue chair. Uh, right, and so the agent has to understand what's the meaning of the word blue and what is the chair, so how can I find it? It's very convenient for humans. It has notion of compositionality. 
so this is sort of where you know these these uh, reinforcement learning, you know, especially in the context of instruction navigation, um, you know, uh, uh, coming together with the language sort of you have to understand the language language aspect and combine it with the visual uh, navigation. So here's an example uh, that I wanted to show you. Here's an engine that moves around. It's a little robot. That's actually the physical system running. And as it's running, it's building what we call the semantic map of the world. It's trying to understand where the walls are, where the open space is, where the different obstacles are. And what it's trying to do is it's trying to find potted plant. So we give it an instruction, find potted plant, and it moves around until it sort of finds you know, the plant. So let's see how we do this. Uh, well, one of the biggest challenges in these tasks is, is exploration, right? So as the agent moves around in the world, it has to explore. How does it explore efficiently? And, you know, in the context of, you know, exploration, you know, you don't want to come to the same place. You want to move around and you want to move around kind of in an efficient way and explore the environment. Um, and so... Um, how do we efficiently explore environment? You know, well, if you just do end-to-end -end reinforcement learning, it's kind of simple and efficient. It has poor generalization. It's, you know, being able to learn about the map and, and, and so forth, it's actually quite difficult to do. So we can, you know, can we build something that's more hierarchical, um, right? And something more modular. So let me show you what uh, we've been looking at. So let's say I give you an observation, right? And gives you some estimate of the pose. There's a little module called Neural SLAM, and SLAM stands for Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. So what it's doing is it basically creates a local map of the environment. It basically says, well, given this image, I think these are the walls. This is the empty space. You see this little green thing that basically says that, um, you know, there's probably a wall here, so it's not a free space, right? Once you get some representation of the map, there is uh, uh, something called the global policy, and the global policy basically defines where you want to go next. So it's telling you go to this specific location. Uh, there is a planning module that basically says, well, given the partial observed map of the environment, find me the best path to get to my goal, right? And then there is sort of uh, uh, a short-term goal, which basically says, okay, I know where I need to go. Now get me, you know, what my what is my plan? What are my set of actions I should execute to, you know, move one meter? Um, right, so there's kind of like a local policy that basically outputs the action, and the actions are typically the controllers of on that sit on your on your agent, right? The controllers are basically saying, well, move 25 centimeters forward, or turn 35 degrees to the right, and then move 10 centimeters forward. Right? So these low-level controllers, what the local policy tries to optimize, right? And this is sort of the example in the virtual environment. Uh, this is uh, what's called the Metaport 3D environment where the agent moves around and it builds the semantic map of the world. You see it explores, and then it's kind of like a global policy sort of telling you, you know, go to this part of the space, now go to this part of the space, and go to this part of the space. And as it moves around, it's trying to explore and figure out where the open uh, uh, spaces, where the closed spaces are, right? One thing that I wanted to point out is that, you know, these methods do work quite well. Um, you know, um, you basically, uh, in, in, in the context of metaphor environment, you kind of like hitting 50% coverage, which basically means that, um, you know, you're 50, it's not perfect, you're 50% there in terms of how much space you've explored given a fixed period of time. But what's interesting is that if you actually make that model hard, which basically means that you have to, you know, go from one location to another location that's very far away from where you are, then what's interesting is that end-to-end -end reinforcement learning models actually do quite badly, they don't perform well. And what effectively they're doing is that, you know, once they move around, they forget where they are so they can come back to the same place they've been before and so forth, right? So this notion of building these explicit maps or semantic maps, you can think of them as semantic memories become very important, uh, right? And, you know, otherwise sort of end-to-end -end reinforcement learning just basically fail to solve these tasks. So that's one message that I wanted to communicate is that sometimes these black box large scale systems, um, you know, um, they, they, they can fail. Um, and so if you build something that's a little bit more modular or decompose the black box into the pieces of little black boxes effectively, 
and you can back propagate the errors through these little black boxes, you know, in many cases that can actually improve uh, your system. Now, in the last part of the talk, let me show you one other example that we've been thinking about this notion of semantic prize and common sense. So let's say I'm in this environment and I tell my agent, find me this image, all right? And let's say there are three paths to explore. What's the path that, you know, what's the first path you would explore? Well, you know, if I were this agent, I would probably say, well, maybe look around and see where path number one would lead me. Path number two looks promising because I think the kitchen might be there. And I wouldn't even go to path number three, right? And the reason I wouldn't choose path number three is because I know, you know, stoves are located in kitchens and kitchens are typically on the first floor, uh, right? So it's, it's kind of like if you have a friend in your house and your friend says, you know, can I go grab a, a glass of water? And you say, yeah, sure, you know, go grab a glass of water. And your friend kind of like starts going upstairs and kind of starts looking in kind of like your bedrooms. And then you'd be like, well, well what are you doing? Um, right, and you know, um, and uh, so this kind of, you know, the common sense that we use in our everyday lives to, you know, make meaningful decisions when we explore and when we do exploration, uh, right? And a lot of existing systems don't do that because for the existing system, uh, you know, unexplored area, unex, uh, unexplored areas, right? So if I'm exploring something, then I'm just gonna be exploring everything. Um, so how can we build these prize? And in fact, you know, maybe we can build perhaps some form of a topological structure where we know something about living rooms and dining rooms and kitchens. Ideally, that's what we would wanna do. One of the things that we've been thinking about is to have some form of graph-based representation. So you can think of nodes as representing areas um, you know, where regular nodes would represent explored areas. So we've seen these areas and ghost nodes would represent unexplored areas. And what's interesting about these systems that you do learning, these ghost nodes typically learn something about doorways or something about hallways that, you know, these would be good areas to explore or these would be unexplored areas. All right, so let's say we're trying to get to the goal image. You know, these, are, again, these are kind of like 3D reconstructions. These are uh, in, in virtual space, in virtual environments. Um, and, you know, again, as we move around and let's say we explore this part, then the ghost nodes would represent kind of like these hallways or doorways. And this is something that the model learns. The model basically learns that hallways, end of the hallway is a good place to go to explore. Or if you see a door, you know, walking through the door is a good way to explore. Right, so these are kind of like low level uh, semantic representations or visual representations that the model is learning. Um, right, and you know, you can think of um, uh, uh, the distance between the nodes is basically the, rel the relative position between, uh, between the nodes. So here's an example of the agent kind of moving around, creating these ghost nodes, figuring out which node it needs to move next and moves around, right? And so here you've reached your goal. So it's actually the goal image was the part of the living room and you reached the living room. This is just a 360 degree camera. And so you found kind of like the correct, uh, the correct spot. And kind of just to give you the high level what these topological slams are, you have these graph updates. You're updating the graph representation of your, of, of your network. The global policy remains the same. The local policy remains the same. And if you compare it to these metric type of systems, they basically the same. It's just that what representation do you want to use? Do you want to use the topological uh, graph-based representation or do you want to use the metric-based representation? And the jury is still out to see which one is, um, which one is better. Um, and in our case, we sort of do see that, you know, these topological maps can do better in terms of being able to explore and find the targets. So these numbers, think of these numbers as representing how good they are. So higher, the better. And these kind of models are also robust to the, to the, po uh, to the uh, noise in your pulse. So sometimes the agent doesn't, you know, the pulse uh, can be a little bit inaccurate. So it doesn't really know exactly where it is, uh, but these models, seem, these models seem to be robust to uh, a noise in, um, in the pulses because we can essentially relocalize. And ultimately where we wanna to go to next is ultimately we wanna be able to build these 3D environments, right? Some form of voxelized representation of the space so that we can actually have the 3D uh, maps. And again, this is just a step, a little, sorry, uh, a little step towards that. This is an agent that moves around in the world and it builds the semantic map. So here it basically says, these are couches, these are tables, these are the chairs, 
as it moves around and explores the environment, right? This is just a 2D representation, but it's the first step uh, uh, to get us uh, the, the kind of like the semantic representation of the world. Right, so here again, if I give it an instruction of go find me the potted plant, and this is what you've seen, this is the agent that explores more and, and actually finds the potted plant. Um, so, and you know, the system runs little convolutional neural network, it runs the policy, um, little reinforcement learning algorithm sits inside it, and it, you know, and it uh, finds, finds the plant. Obviously, there is a lot of interesting work happening in the space of simulation to real. So we train these models in the simulation, and then we transfer them in the real world on the real robots. There is obviously, you know, physical domain gap because the the, the low level um, uh, actuations are not exactly the same. There's a visual domain gap. The images don't look the same in the simulated world versus the real world. Of course, the nice thing about simulation is we can, you know, we can scale it up. In the real world, we can only, uh, you know, we can only fine tune the model a little bit. Um, and so, you know, there, we've been also looking at kind of, you know, uh, looking at the gap, uh, how do we, you know, how do we deal with that? And uh, that could be a talk on its own. Uh, but it seems that these policies that we're learning in a simulation do translate into the real world, which is very exciting. And so ultimately, let me just say that, you know, ultimately we want to, again, be able to build systems that move around autonomously, that can perceive human speech. We're now working in the space of integrating language instructions with these visual navigation tasks. And this is where, you know, the connection to, you know, what we've talked about in the space of question answering comes in. Um, we'll also be able to perceive multimodal input, just images, uh, videos, but also be able to perceive uh, uh, the language and perhaps even the human speech, right? And so ultimately that's sort of uh, a big high level goal of what we're trying to, uh, what we're trying to accomplish. On that note, I think, let me stop and thank all of my students. This is the work of my students, uh, without whom, you know, uh, many, of, uh, many of these things would not, be, would not be possible. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Russ, for this uh, super cool talk. Uh, we have a number of different uh, questions. And if people have uh, more questions, just uh, pose them into the Q&A uh, feature of Zoom. Um, so, uh, to start with the questions, uh, first question is uh, about the work where you talked about uh, graph neural networks um, and the connection with uh, textual uh, uh, with text. Um, the question is how do you? One question was how do you, how do you decide how many hops or what to make the depth of that graph neural network? Yes, um, that's a very good question. So right now, what we're effectively doing is we're assuming uh, that we know how many hops we have, uh, right? Now, some of the experiments that we've seen is, uh, let's say we're looking at the two hop questions. Even if you have one hop question, what the model effectively doing is it's internally answering the question using the first hop and then just copies the answer to the second hop. So what effectively, you know, it's kind of, you know, a hacky way to do it because we basically say, we're gonna be doing three hops. We build a system, we train it across multiple hops, one, two, and three. And the model basically figures out that if, if, if the answer can be answered in one hop, it gets the answer. And then it basically propagates that answer through two other hops and just gives you the answer. So that's essentially what, what we do. There's probably better ways of doing it if you could parse the question more intelligently and say, you know, I think it's a two hop question, plug it into the two hop system, you'd probably improve with, uh, you, the results would probably be improved. Um, in fact, right now, m many of the questions that are labeled as a two hop questions sometimes can actually be answered using one hop because somewhere in Wikipedia, somebody already answered that, you know, uh, or somewhere, you know, when we ask the question, who, uh, where was uh, Steve Jobs kind of uh, company located? I think that, you know, on the web, somebody already answered that question. And if you can kind of get it, then there's only one hop to answer because you have to just find this one sentence. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that happens uh, as well. Uh, good. So people are really excited about graph neural networks and they want to know what uh, library are you using uh, to do your work? So I think that in our case, um, um, I think that we, all of these experiments were done um, um, 
in TensorFlow, I believe, because that was a collaboration with Google. Uh, so I think that the TensorFlow libraries of, you know, whatever TensorFlow has for the graph neural networks. I but see. I think that, you know, we had to do a bunch of tweaks because when we operate on a large scale, uh, in, you know, on, on a large scale setting, we have to do some improvements to actually make it work. Now, one thing I should point out is that specifically for the graph neural networks, uh, we do have code online. So you can actually go and reproduce some of the results that we have. Um, so if you, uh, if you send me an email, if you look online, the code for that specific, you know, combination of a knowledge base, uh, so a combination of graph neural networks for multi-hop is actually uh, online. Super. So you can look it up. Then people have more questions about the natural language understanding uh, part, uh, kind of about any potential issues with situations where you may have conflicts uh, in mentions or you may have entities that are duplicated. Uh, what do you, how do you deal, how do you resolve those? Yeah, right now, it's a good question. Right now, we don't. So, for example, the way that, you know, let's say there are two answers to the question uh, or there are duplicates. Effectively, in uh, let me just go to this particular. Effectively, in this space, um, when we do this aggregation step in in here, when we do this aggregation step, if we have multiple, you know, if we have duplicates, you know, certain words, certain mentions are duplicate. You have multiple duplicate sentences. Let's say that what ends up happening is we're just going to be combining the scores for two of them. So effectively, it's more like doubling the evidence. So if somebody, let's say, think of it as follows. If, if I ask you the question and somebody wrote twice the answer, then in this system, the scores are gonna be added. So it's, it's more like, you know, you can also, you can also kind of like um, uh, uh, adversarially gain the system in some sense, you know, it's kind of like Google search. If, if I keep clicking on the same, if I have a query and I click, keep clicking on the same image many, many, many times, and Google is going to say, well, it's more relevant and it's going to push up. Same thing happens here. If, if there are multiple duplicates for, uh, for the same answer, then that will get kind of- How uh, the evidence gets at, adds up. The evidence gets at, uh, get, gets added up. That's right. What, what happens then uh, on the other end, if you have no answer in your corpus uh, and uh, how do you control for false positives? Yeah, that's also a good question. That we don't handle either. If there is no answer, we always pick up the answer. So right now, because um, uh, the, the assumption here is that there's always an answer in, in one of the mentions. Uh, one way to maybe think about this is that, you know, when we, when we built these uh, um, uh, systems uh, here, for example, right? We always do provide the answer, even if there is no correct answer. But uh, the way that we do it is you can basically say, maybe if you want to deploy the system in the real world, you're probably not going to use it and just say spherical is the answer. What you'd probably do is you would probably provide these five references highlighted in yellow and let the user decide what the right answer is. So this is kind of like if you, if you were thinking about actually deploying the system, you could say these are the best possible answers and you know, the user could decide and, and maybe suggest that the spherical might be the answer. So if there is no answer, you know, the human would have to do. But right now we don't have a way of basically saying we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, good, good answer. Um, then um, another, uh, here's a cool question. So um, uh, this is about combining ideas from question answering and semantic mapping. And it's a kind of an, an observation that voice assistants like, you know, Siri and, and Alexa and so on, uh, seem to have gotten stuck at the level of a uh, single sentence questions and tasks. And could uh, semantic mapping offer the potential to build conversational context so that would make these kind of interactions easier and more natural when we interact with the voice assistants? Yes, I think that's probably, that's probably the future. Um, you know, I know for a fact that, for example, places like Amazon and Google and Apple's and such, are looking into these systems. So think of it as, you know, you can think of it as like Alexa on wheels, you know, as, as a metaphor. Um, you, you can build, uh, you know, if you wanna have, I mean, when we think about these semantic maps, we typically think about semantic maps of the environment. Let's say, you know, you have Alexa on wheels in your house, it moves around, it knows about, 
you can have a conversation, but it's more, more for, you know, uh, uh, understanding of where things are. You know, you can tell it, you know, go find me my keys or go, go to the first floor and switch off my TV or, you know, so I guess we yet to see where this goes. I don't know. Um, uh, but ultimately, yes, ultimately. And the way that we're using right now the semantic maps is we right now using it for instructions. So if we give you a sequence of instructions I want my agent to do, I tell my agent, you know, go, you know, make me a cup of coffee. Then the agent has to understand that the cup of coffee is typically in the kitchen and then it's next to the coffee maker and stuff like that. So this is where the semantic kind of like understanding. And if I move my, if I move my uh, coffee machine from one place to another place, you know, I want my agent to do a little uh, navigation and find, you know, the, uh, you know, the coffee uh, maker, right? And, uh, so, yes. Great. Um, another question is, uh, people are wondering how, how are transformer-based Q&A models differ from knowledge graph-based approaches? And, uh, you know, when and why do we need knowledge graphs? That's a very good question. So uh, I haven't talked about this, uh, but there are really two schools of kind of like, you know, um, you know, if you look at the papers, there's kind of like two schools. One school is what's actually running life in systems. And a lot of it is based on knowledge graphs. The reason why is because knowledge graphs can often give you precise answer. You know, there's something that's called semantic parsing where I give you the question. If I can parse the question and map it into my knowledge graph, then I can give you the answer with probability one, right? Like if I ask you the question of, you know, where is CMU located? You know, if I can map CMU into the node knowledge graph and locate it as a relation, I can just read off from the knowledge graph it's located in Pittsburgh and I can just give you the answer. That's why it's, you know, it's precise if you can do this mapping. Um, Transformer-like systems, what they do is they kind of like work off unstructured text. So, you know, you can encode sentences from Wikipedia, from news articles, from anywhere. So they're much more broad and they can answer many more questions. But the, sometimes, you know, they might not answer the questions correctly, um, uh, right? So they might give you the question with certain, they might give you the answer with certain probability. So it really is, do you kind of like work in unstructured space versus do you construct a knowledge graph? Now, construction of the knowledge graph is very expensive. We have to update it and so forth, whereas kind of looking at unstructured text is less expensive. And so ultimately, it's probably going to be a combination of both. All right, good. And then uh, I'll take the last question. Uh, we are uh, uh, on the top of the hour. So you mentioned this, uh, you said one of the big uh, take home messages from your talk is that sometimes this big fat uh, end to end architectures may not work well and we need to kind of um, create this more uh, kind of neurosymbolic type representation. Uh, could you elaborate on that a bit and perhaps what do you see as types of problems where fat, big fat neural networks are not perhaps the answer? So. So um, let me give you an example of, you know, um, so there are examples where big fat neural networks might be okay. So for example, you could argue, for example, fraud detection, you know, um, you can build a gigantic neural network because you don't really care about whether it makes an error or not. You just want to flag things. You want to say, is the fraud happened or not? And you, 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 try, you, you try to minimize the number of mistakes that you're making and you try to catch all the fraud activities because it's easy to call the customer and say, well, you know, is everything okay? And the customer, yeah, everything is fine, um, right? But if you look at applications, like for example, you know, let's say self-driving cars, you know, there's been a few approaches where people say, well, take the cameras, you know, pass it through the deep neural network and the deep neural network outputs the controllers, you know, press the pedal, turn left, turn right and such. And these systems kind of, I think that they kind of not gonna work very well. For one reason is if you have, you know, an accident, what are you gonna do? Or, you know, you can't just say, well, my neural network just told me to turn left and such. But what works is kind of like the systems that I showed, which is, and again, robotics people have known it for a long time. So it's, we're not like reinventing the wheel here. Um, but you have a system that does semantic mapping. It kind of like identifies where the pedestrians are, where the other cars are, where the roads are. So kind of like building the 3D map of the world. Then there is a planner that basically says, well, given I, I see what the world is, I plan to move, you know, what my, what my, uh, what my, you know, uh, a plan should be.
So um, it seems that uh, gods of internet and connectivity uh, showed us that they uh, still rule the world. Uh, luckily, they uh, showed us this uh, exactly after the, the last question. So uh, we'll just uh, finish here. Uh, sorry, Russ, we lost you, but it's all good. Um, thank you so much for the excellent talk. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for attending. Um, it was great uh, to have everyone. Uh, the next uh, Pinterest Labs uh, talk is going to happen in about a month. Um, and it will be about trustworthy machine learning uh, with a very exciting speaker. So stay tuned. Uh, follow, follow me on Twitter and LinkedIn. This is where these talks get posted. Um, and uh, see you in a month. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. And uh, thank you, Russ, again for a great talk.